I want to articulate in the, in this presentation is really the 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 case for startups and uh, why this can be a, a really exciting opportunity. I get to talk to a lot of engineers and get to talk to them a lot about their decisions to join fang companies, to join other types of tech companies. Um, and uh, I did want to just uh, have a moment to talk about startups. So what we're going to do today, uh, I'm going to introduce myself for uh, uh, very briefly, and then we're going to talk about, you know, why join a startup. Next, we're going to go into kind of the, uh, the most challenging aspect, which is, I think, uh, how to evaluate a startup. And then lastly, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what makes a good uh, startup engineer, what can make you successful at a kind of smaller tech company. So a little bit about me. Uh, you know, I've I've worked at uh, seven different software companies, uh, lots of different internships during my school years, some companies after school, uh, ranging from a three person startup in the basement of some Palo Alto office to 71,000 person organization. Um, learned a lot from those types of uh, environments, their practices, uh, what they care about, things like that. Uh, but by and large, the majority of my career has been spent building Peregrine, and I've been doing that for the last seven years. Uh, I've been doing it with my co-founder, started with two people. Now we have built that company up to 90 plus people and uh, recently raised kind of a, a 30 million Series B. Um, uh, so that's a little bit about me. I wanted to kind of kick off this talk uh, with kind of framing up like what are the dimensions for kind of considering where you should work? What is what is interesting uh, uh, about different companies and what you different what you value? So when I look at companies, uh, I, I think about kind of four different dimensions: people, who are you going to be working with, who's your team, et cetera. Pay, how are you going to be compensated? Is it is it cash? Uh, is it equity? Is it both? Uh, are you going to get lots of vacation? Things like that. Purpose. Uh, what's the mission you're going to be going after? Is the company that you're working at doing something that you're excited about, that you're intrinsically motivated for? And lastly, kind of problems. And problems to me is, you know, as an engineer, like what kind of technical problems are you working on? Uh, are you building kind of widgets and CSS? Are you scaling Postgres? Uh, are you actually having an impact on the product, on the, on the customers? That to me is kind of like the uh, definition for, for problems, you know? As an example, uh, as Rahul mentioned, I worked with the uh, with the UN after school. I felt like it was a really amazing place to meet uh, quite uh, a varied group of people. I really loved the the team that I worked with, uh, and I really loved the purpose. And I got to work with refugees um, uh, and directly impact their lives. And I thought that was uh, a very cool use of of my time. Uh, it did not pay very well, and. It, uh, the, the technical problems were actually probably not that challenging. And I just bring that up as an example because I think these dimensions can change for people as they, as they grow in their career and what they value, what they care about. Um, and I think whenever you're trying to decide whether it's a startup, whether it's a fan company, I think you should think about where you are in life and what matters most to you. And I think that, 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 that helps uh, kind of make, an, uh, make a decision. Okay, so why join a startup? Before we get into that, uh, I did want to frame up like what is a startup because this term is overloaded. It's used in lots of different places. Everyone wants to be a startup. Uh, it's very unclear what that definition is. Um, this is the definition that I want to use for the purposes of this talk. Uh, I've drawn a little graph here to kind of visualize what I'm what I'm talking about. On the y-axis, you see kind of growth potential. Uh, that kind of signals how much does this tech company, like what is their possibility to grow in, in valuation? And then on the x-axis is the, the actual current valuation. And so what you'll notice here is kind of uh, companies that have kind of lower valuation, not a lot of growth potential. Those are lifestyle businesses, great businesses, probably not going to be multi-billion dollar companies. On the right, you see kind of mature businesses. Uh, and those are, you know, things like Google, Microsoft, they're already valued at multiple trillions of dollars. Are they going to 10x in the next few years? Probably not. Uh, that's that's a pretty tall order. Um, so I would not call them like a startup. Uh, and I think this is important framing because there's a lot of companies I think get bucketed in this startup category. I think Databricks is kind of one of them. Nothing against Databricks, but uh, you know they have a 40 billion dollar valuation. 
Um, in order for them to 10x, you know, that would have to mean they become a $400 billion company, which is, you know, pretty rarefied air. Uh, not many companies reach that. I'm sure they have reasoning or reasons why they will get there, but something to consider when you're looking at startups, like what, what is the true growth potential? And then I've put here, uh, kind of Peregrine, uh, I think it has a huge, uh, growth potential and, uh, I think when you look at different different startups, uh, you can kind of evaluate that that growth potential for yourself. And one other thing that I want I uh, want to call out here is I, I drew a little line uh, on the um, on product market fit. I think this is kind of a a proc evaluation can be kind of a proxy for whether or not that company has reached product market fit. And this is an important aspect of startups as well. Uh, I think. It is a vastly different experience when joining a startup that is kind of pre-market fit versus post-market fit. So I do want to draw that distinction because you will um, you will feel that difference if you if you join different companies at different stages. Uh, so you know what is product market fit? It, 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 there's no like true clear black and white definition. Uh, it's often when you know customers are using your product, they're paying for your product, and they're not churning. Uh, for Peregrine. Uh, I felt like we reached product market fit when we had, you know, 10 paying customers at a six figure price point and they weren't churning. That made me feel like we created a real product that was getting value in the market and we could continue to grow on that. Uh, this kind of journey is different for every company. I think I would interrogate that when you're looking at startups and trying to evaluate, are you joining a company that's pre-market or, or post-market? Cool. And, uh, I also want to highlight some of the the differences that that you'll you'll see when you join these companies that at least I have experienced. Um, the thing I want to call out on these dimensions here, uh, you know, pre market fit companies. Uh, I really think the people and the team like really really matter. You're often joining a company that is a handful of folks, uh, and uh, you you know you got to make sure that they work hard. You got to make sure that they're good to work with. Uh, and they're not going to quit. And I think that that is like very critical uh, because you're going to be in the trenches with with those folks. Post-market fit, the company is usually a little bit bigger. Uh, I'd say it, it also matters, but there is definitely a more opportunity to work with more people at that company. On, in terms of pay, uh, if you join a pre-market fit, you, you should definitely expect to get uh, lower cash and kind of a, a higher equity compensation. And on kind of post-market fit, I'd say you would get, you know, closer to market cash, but I would not expect to get like, you know, the the premium salary from a, a startup that has achieved uh, post-market fit, but you can still expect uh, a high equity number. And it's probably like a good sweet spot where you can still have a life-changing amount of equity and still have enough cash to uh, be comfortable. Uh, and lastly, I think like one of the biggest difference here is kind of the type of problem that you work on uh, for pre-market and post-market companies. It, it, in that pre-market stage, you're often doing a lot of zero to one. There's often a lot of churn. You're building new features. Uh, you're trying out new things. You're not really focused on scale. Uh, you're not building like foundational systems. Um, it can be really exciting. I think it's just something to, to be aware of. Uh, and then for post-market fit companies, as, as the name suggests, they often have a product and it's often working. Uh, and you're often building foundations in, in, that, in that platform itself. So maybe that's scaling your Postgres instance to be you know, able to take on billions and billions of rows, something like that. And then lastly, I'll mention for both of, for any startup really, I think the purpose is, is actually uh, really motivating because the, the whole point of a startup is you are working on something new you're building something that doesn't exist uh, and you're trying to create value in the world and that is that's really interesting great all right so uh <laughs> back so here here's here's my perspective i think uh uh the kind of big um i think the big draw in my head to thing is one you get a level of consistency and uh, uh, that's associated when you join a thing company, you probably know what your pay is gonna be. Uh, the company is not gonna go under. Uh, your equity is always gonna be worth something. Um, there's a level of like certainty when you join a thing company that is that is nice. Um, I'll also say that 
you know, I think with fang companies, you get a brand. Um, whether that brand is good or bad, I think that depends on the next company that you join. But uh, you certainly get a brand, and that 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 can be advantageous. Uh, and there's really, you know, I don't want to. Uh, part of this is not to like say it's a bad decision to join Fang. I think it just depends where you are in your career and what you're interested in. The things that get me really excited and why I think uh, joining startups is a little bit underrated. Um, you know, the, the first quality uh, it, it, in my mind is is team, and it's the thing that matters the most to me. I, you know, my my history. I was a competitive gymnast for about 22 years. Uh, I uh, worked on small teams trying to uh, win national championships. And that was uh, an incredible experience for me. And I love that feeling of kind of working together to achieve a goal. And ever since I stopped the sport, uh, I've always been kind of searching for that, searching for that, like work together with a small group of people to achieve an aud audacious outcome. And I think that really only exists at small companies, at startups, where you can actually feel uh, feel everybody hyper-motivated, really wants to make this work. And it's really you against the world. The, the most likely outcome for like startups is that they'll fail. And uh, the fact that that, uh, that that is true means that it's more exciting to kind of work there and try to make something awesome. And what you do, what you bring to work that day actually matters. And I think, you know, my... Critique on fang companies is essentially like whether you show up to work that day, uh, uh, it doesn't actually matter. And I think, um, you know, the, the fang companies will go on with or without you uh, and they will still build products. Uh, and I think you can really get a sense of camaraderie and excitement at, at a startup. Uh, you know, just as an example, at Peregrine, you know, we recently hit our goals for our um, our, our metrics for Q2, which was which was very recent. And you can palpably feel the excitement. You can feel it in the office. People are walking around. They're motivated. Uh, and I think that that is rare. And it is it's just like a fun environment to be in. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't discount that because uh, it's kind of a, you know, it's a little bit nebulous, but uh, important to bring up. Uh, the second bit I want to talk about is is about impact. Um, you know, I have a one story uh, of a friend who now works at Peregrine, who previously worked at uh, Meta, he spent two years working on a JavaScript engine um, at, uh, every day, kind of building the different functions in JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the two years and when he was finished, he found out that there was another team building uh, a JavaScript engine as well. And uh, they chose the other team's JavaScript engine. Um, and they essentially just like kind of threw out uh, all the work they did over the past two years, you know. Uh, which depending on what your mindset is, that can be quite painful. Um, and I think at a, a, at a startup, that is just not an option. Uh, you are under-resourced and the work that you do has to get used. It is used by customers. You can feel it. You can see it. You can talk to real customers. Uh, and that's a, uh, the impact and the type of problems you get to work on is, is really cool, especially at, uh, at, companies that are scaling like Peregrine, I think it's it's common to join a company when they are, you know, they haven't hit scale yet uh, and, and there isn't really any challenging tech problems. And it's really common to join companies who have scaled already and they already have like really intense data systems. But at a startup, you can actually be front row seat to um, how, do you, how do you actually scale Elasticsearch? How do you scale Postgres? And you can work, you can actually get in the weeds work on those problems. Uh, and, and really it's, it's your own, it's your own, um, your own adventure, you know, because I, I spent so long, uh, working at a startup, you know, I worked on the pixels of, of different, uh, buttons that we were building, but I also worked on the infrastructure, uh, for, for Kubernetes. And I think the opportunity to kind of hone your skill set and really get close to the metal with no rails is, is just like a great way to learn. All right, and then the last two points here that I'll just bring up. Uh, I think the the most common thing that I hear from engineers wanting to join fang companies is is pay. Uh, what I will say and what I've seen is I, I don't actually think the the cash comp is is that terribly different. Um, 
But I do think, you know, depending on how you value the equity, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, uh, you can perceive your your salary being quite different. Um, but I do think, you know, a life changing amount of money uh, can happen at startups when uh, you get equity in a company that is not valued super highly yet and has the potential to 10x and even 100x. Uh, and the last point that I'll mention on Fang uh, and that what I love about startups is is the mission. And you know, it's it's why I started Peregrine. Um, I think you get to to actually choose the company and what they do and what you're passionate about and work on it. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of these businesses kind of have their business model and they have to optimize around that. I mean, uh, you know, Google makes a lot of money from ads. That is going to be a very big priority for that business. And that's okay. Uh, but I think at a startup, you have a more diversity of of true true missions. So um that is kind of like how I articulate on the different dimensions that I brought up before why I might join a startup. I think hopefully at this point maybe uh you can see it, it could be exciting to join a startup. Uh however, I will say that like evaluating a startup matters because all of those things can be true but uh you know it varies greatly. Uh, you don't get that level of consistency that you get from kind of fang companies. And what I want to talk about a little bit is how you can evaluate a startup. Uh, and this is a really deep topic and there's a lot of different perspectives you can take. Uh, what I hope to provide here is a little bit of, uh, of a framework, some questions to think about. I think engineers tend to be very good at kind of assessing out the technical problems they're working on, the, the team that they'll be working with, but I often find that engineers overlook kind of the business aspects. And I, I think that is important when you're looking at a startup. Um, great. So, you know, the first thing, I think this is kind of like uh, table stakes. Uh, how much money does this business have coming in? How much money does it have going out? How much money is in the bank? Uh, if, they, if you look at the answer to all those and the company has a runway of less than 12 months, you should ask for an answer to how they are going to get more money. And you should believe that answer. And uh, if they don't tell you the answer to the the three above questions, you should you should be kind of concerned about that. Um, if the answer to the three questions on above kind of equate to a runway that's more than two years, uh, I would say you're good to go. That is a an eternity in in startup land. Uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't you know worry too much on that on that uh, front. Where to look closely. Uh, you know, I think not all startups are equal and there are different, different markets, different industries, things like that. Uh, things that I would examine more closely, uh, hype cycle businesses. So, uh, currently I think we're kind of in a hype cycle for, for AI. And it's not to say that we won't find in tremendous value in AI companies. I am confident that we will, but there is a ton of them and they are being valued very highly. And I think if you think about where you can make the most uh, off of your equity, um, joining a hype cycle business, you have to really believe that the the kind of inflated valuation will come true and more. So uh, I would just eye that with some skepticism and ensure that you have a reasoning from either the, the co-founders or pe leaders at the company on why this company is differentiated from the next startup that's doing the same kind of AI thing. The other thing I note, uh, which is, I think, a little bit more controversial, but I tend to view consumer businesses with a bit more skepticism. I think building a multi-billion dollar consumer facing business is a very challenging thing to do. Uh, and the reason I think this is, is because one, consumers tend to be really fickle and it's hard to get them to pay money. And two, you are going to face a lot of competition from kind of the fang-like companies. Uh, those companies often operate in in the in the consumer space, and uh, they can they can eat your lunch. I think uh, you know Yelp is kind of an canonical example. Not that it wasn't a successful startup, but uh, you know when Google launched its own reviews for for restaurants, things like that, um, it directly competed with Yelp, and that that is like a scary proposition. Cool. All right. So assessing potential. Uh, you know, I think this is the this is this is the the second half to the assessment in my mind. Uh, what's the risk that it's going to fail? Now, what's the risk that it's actually going to grow as as much as you know the founders, the leaders, the people there say it's going to grow? And for a post market fit company, I think it, it it really is like less likely for this company to truly fail. They have found product market fit. They are having paying customers. Uh, 
it, in my mind, it's more of a question of how successful this business will be. And in pre-market companies, as I mentioned before, I think you just have to interrogate the team. Uh, you really have to understand the people that you're working with. What are their prior experiences? Do they have the experience to do the things that they're saying? Uh, and if they don't, how will they how will they get that experience? So um, those are really important things to suss out when you're when you're looking at a startup. And then uh, a question that I I recommend folks who are interviewing uh, with startups to, to to ask founders or leaders is you know what do I have to believe in order for this company to reach the valuation or the growth that you are telling me it's going to reach? And I think this brings out a a uh, often interesting responses from, from founders. And if they don't have answers to this, that's probably not a good sign. Uh, and then when they give you your answer, I think uh, it's incumbent on you to actually ask yourself if you believe them and do your own research, try and figure out if, uh, if what they're saying makes sense to you. Some other questions that I would ask that aren't in kind of the, the engineering realm that I think are, are useful. Uh, does anyone make sales besides the founders? This is such a common problem in, in startups today that engineers don't really register or know about. Uh, when you build a company, it's often the case that founders do much of the selling and it's uh, very difficult to build a sales team. And oftentimes, especially if they're engineers, they don't have experience doing it. Uh, and that is like a critical piece to, to growing a startup uh, rapidly. And um, I would always interrogate the question to, to that. Second thing, uh, how many customers do you have? And then uh, all equally important is what's the distribution of revenue? Uh, when you join a company and they have 10 customers and 90% of their uh, revenue is from one customer, like what is special about that customer? Are they going to get more of those types of customers or less? And if that customer churns, like how, how, how bad is that for the company? Uh, so I think you, you, you should look at that uh, and understand the risk there. And then lastly, uh, I, I would ask the question on like, what are your expectations for managers? How are they evaluated? You know, for a pre-market fit company, I would not expect a super detailed answer here. Uh, I would essentially, <laughs> and, and I do believe that, you know, for, for small companies, they shouldn't be focusing heavily on management and they should be focusing on building and delivering value to customers. For post-market fit companies, uh, you'd expect to see this to be, to mature a little bit, right? They are building a company, they have, you know, dozens of people probably at the company, it's probably not going to be as robust as, you know, a, a meta, but you should start to see the, the seeds of a real organization being grown. Cool. Okay. Uh, last bit here. Um, what makes a good startup engineer? And, you know, I've had the pleasure of, of working with a lot of incredible engineers uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, and I just wanted to to mention some qualities that I think make certain engineers really good in startup environments. Number one, uh, being autonomous, this kind of uh, relates back to the point of when you are at a startup, you probably don't have as many rails, as much handholding. Um, and what makes a what makes you autonomous? at a startup, I think it, it means you have business context. It means you understand the business problem that the startup is trying to solve. So you can make good decisions on priorities and what to build. It means that you're motivated. It, you don't need somebody to tell you, finish your tickets, finish your bugs, you do it. And you're proactive about it. And then, you know, I think you need to sk the, the skill as well to be able to execute on, the, uh, on those set items. Secondly, uh, service service orientation. I think this is really important in startups. Uh, there's no problem too small. There's a you know building a startup is messy and dirty, and it's not always going to be clean problems. And that's actually I think uh, I would argue a good sign. Uh, and so you just have to have the mindset that you are going to get to an outcome and uh, put the business priorities first. Uh, thirdly, extreme ownership. I think engineers who come in. Uh, with an extreme ownership mindset often do very well. Uh, engineering teams at startups are often under-resourced. They have way too many problems. And having that, that kind of mentality uh, uh, is hyper-valuable and allows you to, to kind of uh, move mountains. And the last thing I want to talk about is the Stockdale paradox mindset. And what I mean by this is engineers uh, who come in with kind of a 
uh, unwaver unwavering realism. So the ability to see the problems as they are, uh, understand like the issues that the the product is facing with the customer, et cetera, uh, be able to hold that, leverage it, harness it, but then also have an unshakable optimism that the the company will overcome and we will eventually get past those problems. And having that optimism is infectious. And I think uh, having optimism at a company uh, is really important. Obviously, not uh, uh, kind of blind optimism, but optimism and also facing kind of the real facts on the ground is a secret sauce to, to being like highly effective and building a really incredible culture. Um, uh, and the last point I'll bring up here is that, uh, you know, at Peregrine, we've hired quite a few Thing engineers uh, that were, you know, worked at yeah, Google, Meta, Face, uh, uh, all those types of companies that for for many years, and uh, the ones that I find that have these these qualities have all come back and and talked to me about like the the uh, sense of liberation that they have felt working at Peregrine and like really being able to have their talent uh, match the impact that they can have on the company, and that's cool to see. And uh, I'll just say like. Uh, with with those kind of qualities on an engineer, you can um, you can really fly at, at, at small small startups. And with that, I think I finished almost in thirty minutes. Uh, I am happy to dive deeper into any any pieces um, or other questions that that folks might have. <laughs>